On behalf of Charlotte Jackson Fine Art, welcome to A Gallery Talk between Johnny Winona Ross and David Chickey. Thank you, Charlotte, for having us here. We're um, excited to have an excuse to spend a little bit of time together. Johnny and I go uh, quite a ways back, um, and Johnny's book was the one of the first books on Radius's list the first year we launched the publishing company. So we're about to celebrate our 10th anniversary this fall, and our first year in 2007, we published four books, and Johnny's book was one of them. So it's really amazing um, to for us to be, you know, get a chance to talk about um, what's happened in 10 years, and, um, and also think about um, his work, and um, I think it's it's um, quite remarkable that the, um, the book itself feels um, to me as relevant to your work as it did ten years ago, which I think is a testament to what Johnny has done as an artist and the way that he has um, really continued this incredible investigation into um, the development of this work. Thank you. I keep a book in my studio, and I, I have it open a surprising amount of time. Uh, a little thing that I just spoke to David about, 10 years ago when we were on press uh, outside of Frankfurt, uh, where the book was printed, David got the first iPhone I ever saw. <laughs> And he didn't know how to work it. So it was, it was great fun turning it around and watching the screen move. And, um, it, was, it was a while back. It's hard to believe that phones were new then. I mean, um, so I want to start um, the, the two pieces of text in the book. Um, there was an intro written by Douglas Dryspoon, and the main essay was written by Carter Radcliffe, both really incredible incredible men and incredible writers. And there's um, the start of Doug's introduction, I think is a really nice way to start talking about Johnny's work. So I'm gonna read just this first couple of sentences. These paintings embody two worlds, one a realm of serene order, the other more unpredictable, a place prone to accident and surprise encounter. The balancing of divergent realms fraught with tension is a salient characteristic of this work, where temporal forces, like imaginary rivers glimpsed from the heavens, surge beneath planes of pure light. And, and Johnny and I talked about this a little bit. That sparks for me maybe a bit of a conversation. I think it's always interesting to talk to Johnny about how he makes these incredible pieces. And I think what Doug is talking about is this difference between the white horizontal bands of the work in contrast to the vertical rivulets of color that are coming down the pieces. And so, can you talk a little bit about the process, how you started this, where it comes from? And well, first, I would love to be able to verbalize as well as Doug. <laughs> uh, I read something like that and I think, whoa, oh. <laughs> he's very good. Um, well, first, uh, one of the things that's really important with the work is to approach every aspect of the work as a important part of the whole. And maybe because I'm from the 60s and I read The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where every screw is as important as the, the whole machine. but. Uh, I used to make all my stretchers, and I used to mix a lot of my paint. And one of the first things that I did as I got able to was to have John Ansley uh, make the stretchers out of basswood. He's in, um, outside of uh, San Francisco. And he's, a, he's a, a great craftsman, and I hope, I think his son has taken over his business now. And I also get my tax, the copper tax, from San Francisco. It's uh, they're handmade. Uh, my linen is a uh, Belgium linen. Uh, 
mostly handwoven. So I start with a structure that has a quality to it that makes you want to keep that quality in the work. Uh, don't touch them, but if you do touch them, don't. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, tautness of the linen is the same tautness at the palm of your hand. So as I, I push against the linen with my brush, uh, it, it feels like I'm actually pushing against uh, the palm of my hand. I, I just want to interject, if you, when you look at the work, I think this talk about material becomes so important, and I know that in the book it was very important to show as much as possible that structure. Not only did we actually reproduce the back of one of the canvases photographed, I think, I think yeah. the photographer thought I was a little crazy, but we turned the painting around and wanted to photograph the structure of the painting because it is truly remarkable the way these objects are made. But from the side, too, when you're just seeing the piece on the wall, those handmade copper tacks and the edge of the linen that you see, and then Johnny's marks. So as you're working on the work, he's, he's documenting how many layers, how many times he's putting something on the surface of the canvas, and, and, and I think that's amazing to see in the work, too. Yeah, when the numbers get over 10, I have to start keeping track, and a lot of these paintings, the one behind me in particular, has about 250 layers on it, and each layer is burnished, and if you burnish too much, it's not good. If you don't burnish enough, it's not good, so I really have to keep track. My, my old mind um, just can't keep all of those numbers straight. And I also visually really love the, uh, the look of those little tick marks uh, on the edge. Um, a, a little side with that is every once in a while someone will want to frame one of the pieces. And it used to really bother me because the, the paintings are painted on the wall. Uh, they're not painted on an easel, so they relate to the wall. And if you put a frame on it, you remove that relationship. And I first started, I started thinking, once the painting is purchased, I don't have control over it anymore. But the one thing I could do is sign the side and it's worked. I haven't seen any, um, any frame pieces since I began to sign. Yeah, I wish I could. That is so heavy from so much pain on it. Uh, it'd be impossible for me and my old back to pick up and turn it around. But if you ever get a chance, uh, look at the back of one of these. They're, I give a lot of credit to Johnny Ensley in San Francisco. So can you talk a little bit about how you prep the canvas and then how the layers are applied as you work through the process? Basically, there's three general uh, categories that involves the construction with color. The first is after the linen is sized and stable which is about 15 layers, something like that. And that's pretty mechanical, but it's, it's a prelude to the rest. I uh, begin to apply the ground color. And the ground color is made up of many, many colors. Uh, for instance, the painting on my left side, your right side, uh, started with black gesso. And black gesso is uh, a fairly special gesso that's made with um, burnt bone, burnt animal bones. And um, I made sure that no animals were injured uh, during the formulation there. And then once I get the uh, color started, that, for instance, had a lot of purple in it. Um, a lot of yellows. 
I don't necessarily remember putting greens. It was mostly an optical mix of yellows and blues and purples, and also a lot of white and just layer after layer. And it makes a complexity that feels a little bit like water, uh, looking into water. A lot of, a lot of reflection, uh, it's not flat at all. As you get toward the edge, you, you begin to see the color changes. You can see some of the original colors. And that usually takes anywhere from two to three, maybe four weeks to get the ground um, formulated. And I work generally seven days a week and probably 10 to 12 hours a day. So it's, it's a fair number of hours. Then I, uh, I start with the horizontal striations. And I think of horizontal striations almost as a man, uh, a human made structure. It's, it is drawn on and I, I literally, I have these beautiful German brushes that are so sensitive and I just pull the paint across from left to right and then from right to left. And what it does is deposit a little extra paint on the uh, edges and a little less in the very center. And once I get that rhythm started, which is a constructed rhythm, then I, I begin with the, I begin with the, uh, the drips. And the drips are a direct response to a particular situation I've been in, the landscape. Uh, usually it's a uh, pre-Columbian site. Uh, it could be canyons, it could be hanging gardens, but it's something that has affected me. And the color is also uh, from the site. And it's just, it's just an evolution at that point. It's putting down the white, putting the drips in. The drips go where they want to go. If it's if it's a stormy day, for instance, the drips generally don't drip from top to bottom. They'll have little kinks in it, they'll curve a little bit. It's, it's really kind of interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing some of the aspect of the site into the process. Uh, it's, it's all one to me. Does that make a little bit? I, I remember yeah. talking about this before and always being fascinated by the effect essentially of atmospheric pressure of, of the environment around you, of the weather, of the land, of the light, the impact that it has on, the, on what happens when, when this natural form of dropping something from the top, mm -hmm. liquid dropping from the top of the canvas to the bottom of the canvas is, 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 is affected that much by the basic surroundings that you're in, um, which to jump a little bit from, from the technical to the more um, theoretical about why, how you started this work or where you started this work, I'm always drawn to this relationship between ideas of the landscape, of ideas of the place in which you live and how it impacts this. And that's, you know, there's a technical relationship, these horizontal lines that we think of about potentially landscape, although these are not in any way landscape paintings. But uh, so maybe a little bit about the evolution of the of the form for you, how it happened. I'm, I'm, if you get a chance to look through the book, the book is an opportunity to see some of those early pieces and how this this vocabulary came in this very slow but organic way um, from some of that early work and. And maybe talk a little bit about how that happened. Uh, we, we, we just, we are so fortunate to live in this area where we can drive a few hours or a half hour sometimes to some of the canyons and see some of the sites that are, it, it, it is our true American art history heritage. And I, I took six years of art history 
an undergraduate and graduate school, and it was predominantly European art history and some uh, Oriental, but predominantly it was Eurocentric. And as I started exploring the canyons many decades ago, uh, I came upon the first sites, uh, Native, Native American sites, uh, the basket maker sites, and uh, the Barrier Canyon sites, which they don't know exactly how old they are, but they're 10, 15,000 years. And it was so beautiful to me. It, it wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. Uh, first off, it wasn't in a museum, and it was just, it was just charged to me. The, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, actually. And it was really the first time I understood visual language, uh, something you couldn't verbalize. And that was really the beginning of the painting. Um, and I understood perfectly de Kooning, Pollock, Frankenthaler. Uh, I understood what they were working with, that nonverbal language. Hard to describe. My, my work is very difficult to write about. Uh, and I take a great deal of pride in that. <laughs> because it's, it is a visual language. So basically what I, I really work toward is to create a painting that gives the feeling of being at one of the sites. Uh, something you can't explain, but you can feel it. It's, uh, the best analogy to that for me is listening to music. You listen to John Coltrane or Miles early work, and uh, you just you can't talk about it. it. It is its own language. So that is the basic assumption of the work, is to create something like that, where you stand in front of it, and you can't really describe it. You can feel it if, you're, if you stand there long enough and you're looking intently at it and it keeps opening up. But that's the magic for me in the work. The other, the other thing that's really important is I am a painter. And there's not a lot of painters left. It's, it, it's a narrowing profession. Uh, I use paint brushes. I use mineral pigments that drip. Uh, I mix my paints. I apply the paints with a brush against the wall. I stretch linen on wood. And I'm part of a stream that started pre-Renaissance. And I hope I'm not at the very end of that stream, but I'm, I'm going through that stream. And it's important for me to recognize the things that's happened before with wooden stretchers and oil paint, then acrylic paint, mixing marble with the pigments, burnishing. Those are all things that other people have discovered that I utilize. I'm part of that history. But at the same time, I'm using paint uh, that was formulated a few years ago. And these paintings couldn't really, uh, more than a few, 30 years ago now. But the paintings could not have been done prior to 30 years ago. So there is a contemporary bend to the work, but at the same time giving homage to the historical context that the paintings are setting in. So that's another aspect of the work that uh, is, is really important to me. Several questions came up as you were saying that that was amazing, but um, one is what was the technical innovation 30 years ago in paint that changed things for you? I'm curious. Acrylic. Acrylic, okay. Yeah, it sounds silly. It's plastic. Yeah. Uh, I used to use oil paint up until about, I think Jay has some oil paint. 
And oil, uh, I'm sorry, Jay has a couple of paintings that are at least about 20 years old right now. Yeah, 98. And if oil paint is not in light, and it can be a very small amount of light, but if they're stored covered, for instance, and they're in total darkness, the whites turn yellow. They can become white again once they're in light. But there's a, there's a transition that occurs in the pigment. They're not stable. They have to be cared for in a particular way. Acrylic, you could drive a truck over these things. <laughs> I mean, they're, the, the pigments are very, very stable. They're tough. They're a bit difficult to work with, so they don't look like plastic, but when you're using mineral pigments and you're mixing marble in those pigments, all of a sudden it gives it kind of an old historical quality that uh, regular acrylic just doesn't have. The other, the other yeah. thing I wanted to touch on, because I think it's so, critical to thinking about your work. Um, and it was something that became um, very much an issue in doing the book, um, which is something you touched on, which is how hard it is to talk about these paintings. And I think there's a little bit of an oxymoron built into the idea that we're having a conversation about his work, when I think often the best way to experience Johnny's work is to sit alone in a room of the work or a painting and just experience it, just feel it, not try to talk about it, but you know, here we are talking about it. And we also hired Carter Radcliffe to write an essay about it, and um, I had a huge admiration for Carter all the way back through art history school, and, um, and Carter clearly in early conversations is a huge, huge fan of Johnny's work. And so he, you know, for this, non-existent, young, up-and-coming publishing company, he said yes to writing the essay, which was great. And then I think he genuinely struggled with what to write. And the essay, when you read it, is largely about how difficult it is to write words about this work. And um, so there is, there's a real depth, and I, and I think it's, it's a testament to the work. Of almost all the work that we've published, I think this is, this is some of the most difficult work to think about how you talk about it. And I think a lot of people have tried to talk about it in ways of comparing it to other work or thinking about other artists, and yet it defies that as well. You can't really draw parallels between other artists or other things. It, it really just is an experience, which is incredible. And I just, I just want to echo that. I, you, I should say I, uh, as I'm working on the pieces and I'm looking straight ahead, I'm looking straight ahead at the uh, yellow painting there, uh, there's a, a, a sensuality about the work. Uh, it appeals to the senses uh, much more than the intellect. And uh, with what David was talking about, not only I'm going to sound like a problem child with all of uh, all the problems we had with publishing, but just taking photographs of the pieces is difficult because when when you're looking head on at one of the paintings, for instance, a painting behind me, uh, it looks like a flat painting uh, in terms of sheen. As you get to the side of it, uh, it looks like marble that has been handled so much. It it's, it has not a, a glossy finish, but it's more of a marble polish to it. And to photograph the duality of the flatness of looking head on, as well as what you see when you're looking at about 15 degrees to the surface, is, is very hard to pick up. And as David knows, we went through a lot of photographers. We ended and, up, yeah, we ended up doing 
four different photo shoots or five in different locations because the work was scattered around and we had to learn, first we had to learn how to take images that, that worked, that could be replicated, that looked like the work, which was a, a big hurdle. But then once we cleared that hurdle, we had to hire four different photographers. One who did a photo shoot in New York, there was one here in Santa Fe, there was one in Taos, and we, where was the other? Now I can't remember, we rented a facility somewhere yeah. so that the paintings that were in that area could be taken to that place so that the photographer could photograph them. And then the other thing that became really evident is that they are objects as much as they are two-dimensional paintings, and the experience of them is so dependent on scale that we then make a, made a decision that every painting in this book is photographed from the same distance from the camera, right? So small paintings look small and big paintings look big, so that you actually get the relevance of scale as you're looking at the work. And that became critically important in terms of understanding them. Really, it's almost thinking about them as more sculpture than as, as paintings. And then we did a lot of details along the sides taken from angles to show the edges of the painting, to show the way that the light shifts as it goes across the surface. And so when you look across a piece, it looks quite different than when you look straight at a piece. Um, yeah. yeah. And David was really sensitive to the printing process. Uh, he used, we used a company out of Frankfurt called Kantz. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, it's Kantz. It's Kantz. Actually, Dr. Kantz Drukerai. Um, I couldn't ever um, say that. <laughs> formed um, a, a very, very well-known printing company um, yeah, outside of Frankfurt. Um, it is. It has evolved. The printing company was what began the company. It has evolved into a, a publishing entity known as Hache Kantz. So you may have heard of them as publishers. But the printing division, at the time when Johnny and I went there, um, certainly had the reputation and was one of the most remarkable technical printers anywhere in the world. About five years ago, they folded the division of the printing company that is who we worked with to print this book. They, know, they really no longer print books like this. Um, but I can remember when we were on press, there were moments printing subtle tonalities is the most technically challenging thing you can do. It's much more straightforward to print bold, strong color. Um, there were times when we were printing these pages when they would take the felt rollers off of the plates, underneath the plates, so that there would be less pressure on the paper, so that the plates would just kiss the paper more subtly, as opposed to put more ink, because everything they were printing was a little too strong. And when they did that, I had never seen a printer go to those kinds of technical um, complications. Um, it was incredible what they did. Um, and two small things about the printing. And I, I'm speaking about the process of printing the book because it's, it was similar to the process of doing the painting. It, it, was, uh, it was pretty incredible to watch. But that was my first book. And I've, I've had several catalogs before that. So I, I, I was pretty nervous. And we were on press for seven days or eight days. Something yeah, like a that. A full week. Yeah. And the process is early in the morning when the, uh, the first shift starts, you get a phone call uh, from the, the press, and you literally stand there as they're running each page, and you're approving the colors or having them change the colors. And it goes, it would go from seven to seven right. most days. And it was intense. And I remember David on one of the way sheets. Um, it was the cover. And he circled, he circled this with a magic marker on the, the way sheet. And then he, he put an arrow pointing up. And it said up. And I thought it was kind of silly, but it's okay, it's my first book, I'm learning. 
when we got the boxes of books, they, the boxes are heavy enough, they didn't fly them over. Uh, didn't they? <laughs> they came by boat. It takes a long time from Frankfurt uh, by boat. And I opened the box and I looked at the cover and let, let me just show you this, because this is one of the few left. It was all upside down. <laughs> That's the top. As you can see, the book was printed upside down. The cover was printed upside down. So, I didn't know what to do. David, David said, well, I circled the thing, put an up arrow, and we had to ship the books back. I, I think they flew the books back, didn't they? I think, I think it was the advance copies yeah. before they had shipped the books that arrived. But there's nothing uh, representational on the cover to say that, and so there's nothing to indicate to the printer what was up and what was down, which is why I did what I did, was to demonstrate to them that this is the top of this. You're not gonna know when you go to buy to these books what's the top and what's the bottom, because it's not obvious. When you're looking at it, be sure that you do it this way. And so when we got the advanced copies, they had been done upside down. Um, we weren't sure and we never will know how many were bound that way. Often when things go into binding, they will just run the sheets in and the binders will run them through the bindery. And so I think what ultimately happened is some were printed, some were bound upside down, some were bound right side up. They didn't really pay attention to it when they were doing the bindery, which is remarkable because they are one of the most precise printers and binders anywhere in the world. But nonetheless, so we then had to go back to them and they had to fix all of the ones. But it's what's remarkable is that every once in a while, 10 years later, somehow or another, one has snuck through the process. So we went up today to Charlotte's office to talk about um, the process. And so now I sort of lovingly refer to these as like our 55D you know, books. They're like the special, like really rare ones. Um, this is an upside down one. Um, and so they, they do kind of still exist a little bit, but, but the vast majority of them are right. And David took a lot of photographs of the upside down one with this new iPhone. <laughs> And if you have any questions also, feel free to, feel free to ask. We can keep, we or, can, or not. Or not, We're, we can keep yeah. going. Um, yeah. You, you had mentioned that um, you were saying there's not a lot of pages left that are mm -hmm. going to go to the detail and the level of refinement that you do. What is happening? I, I just think culture and society both is changing, obviously, it's changing very rapidly right now. I'm a music person also, and I, I listen to jazz a lot, uh, symphonic music, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing the same thing happening with the musicians. Uh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm several generations old with this, but I think there's, there's a process in learning a skill, uh, either as a painter or John Ansley as a, as a woodworker making stretchers. It's, it's a long process and it's something you really have to be patient to go through. You have to have good teachers. Uh, and you also have to have a love of what you're doing. I mean, just a passion because you're going to be spending your life doing it. And again, I don't want to sound like an old guy, but I know some younger people that are going through that process. But I also see an awful lot of people that are not going through the process. And they could be creating some great art. Uh, but it's different. Uh, it's, it's usually a photography-based type of work, and uh, again, it could be very good work, and it could affect people, but it's different. So that's what I meant. Uh, it's, 
when you go when you walk through an art school now, it, it has a very different feeling than the the schools I went through, where everybody kind of sensed what you needed to do to get to that point. And if you couldn't do that, you dropped out of school or you changed your major. And now it's it, it feels a little different. Again, not bad, but not the same type of um, care, I think, that, that goes, goes into this. I have a, a friend, uh, a neighbor, he's, he's uh, kind of ill right now. Uh, his name is David LaFell. And I, I think he's 81, 82, and he paints, I think he's a, I think he's a great painter. Very, very different from my paintings. He paints like Rembrandt. And he has spent his life perfecting that skill. And I'm in, in awe uh, at what he can do. And there's not going to be another person, I don't think, like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of seeing the end of that type of thing happening right now. Yeah. In between, uh, let me back it up a little bit. The earlier paintings, Chase paintings, for instance, those two, those were really mostly painted on the East Coast. And I lived in Maine, and you're in darkness a lot in Maine. It's not just cold, but it's dark. Uh, it gets dark at 3.30 in the afternoon in the winter. Uh, trees are all over the place. I mean, I've really enjoyed not having trees around. <laughs> um, but it, that has affected uh, the work. The work had, I, I think, a, not just color, but a, kind of a darkness to it. And as I've gotten used to living out here for the past 20 years, uh, the work has lightened up. And, and I also say lighten up not just in terms of value, uh, black and white value, or slightly um, diluted saturation, um, but they also don't have the levity that the work had in back east. Uh, there's just a general lightness. And it's evolved into more color, but the color is very different from the East Coast paintings. It's, uh, I, I look at it as, I know it's a way overused word, but they feel much more joyful to me uh, than they did in the past. And that's what I've been working on myself, so <laughs> it just shows up in the work. You also, I remember, I, th I thought last night when I came and saw these paintings for the first time, um, I thought about music in ways that I haven't maybe in the past as much. And you've, you've mentioned the music now two or three times in this talk, and I don't remember that from a few, as many years ago. Is, it, is music playing more of a role? It, it is, it's, but it's more the memory of music. It just, um, again, it goes back to that non Nonverbal language, and it's it's I can't even explain it. It's it, but it's it's all one thing. Uh, I play music in the studio periodically, not all the time, uh, but it's the memory, the rhythm. Uh, it's it's just another language, and I, I I think in the era we're living in in this country. I would say the word politics, but I don't want to. But what we're living through right now, uh, I, I, I am truly looking for a, 
an, another way of expression. Uh, I, I use the word sanctuary. And I use my paintings a lot as a sanctuary now. Um, when I'm just sitting in front of them, looking at them, uh, my mind relaxes a little bit. And that's really important. And I know Matisse said the same thing back in the 30s. Uh, but especially now, it's, it's just an important aspect of the work. I tried my best. <laughs> I tried keyboard when I was younger, and I, uh, I don't know how much I want to go in this, but I was a DJ at one time. <laughs> so I played music, but I didn't create the music, but I, I put lines of music together, and I could alter, especially at clubs, I could, I could really alter a large, assembly of people by putting certain, setting up transitions of music, uh, bringing people up, dropping them down. And it was, it was, I approached it in the same way I do with the paintings. But no, I can't. I would love to be able to play music. But then I probably wouldn't paint as much, so. <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course, of course. At the uh, Rothko Chapel in Houston was, it was one of the, I would, I would equate the Rothko Chapel to what I was talking about with the sites and the canyons. Uh, you're, you're not in a museum. You're in a, an environment uh, that was created, as far as I know, for those particular paintings. Uh, the light is so low in there. You have to take time to allow your eyes to adjust to the painting or you don't see anything. And it's, it's beautiful. Good eyes you have. Because yes, he was important. Um, Rothko, de Kooning, Pollock, Donald Judd, um, Eve Hess, Pierre Bernard was very important. And I could just keep John Coltrane, Miles Davis. Um, those, all of those people are mixed, mixed in with the work. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say the, the word that everybody jumps on me for, and that's Agnes Martin. Um, I love her paper pieces. The, the, the small nine by nine inch, I think are just gorgeous. I mean, I would love to have one of Agnes's paper pieces. Um, her paintings are important. I, I, I see the importance and I love the phenomena of Agnes living in an area very close to me. And she painted in a very masculine culture and thrived in that culture. I think it probably played havoc with her mental state at points, but she, she did very well in that. Um, I like the serenity of her work, but it, her work always lack something from, from me. I, I needed some physical, physical thing. And uh, I always speak of, of Agnes, not the paper pieces. The paper pieces had a physicality to it. Just the, a lot of the tracing paper she would paint wrinkled up a little bit. And it was, it was beautiful. Um, but I always looked at Agnes's paintings as something I couldn't quite get a hold of. I couldn't put my arms around it. It was always ethereal, which is what it works about. And 
From the beginning, I tried to create work that had a physical presence to it, that you could literally get your arms around. Uh, if you have one, you can touch it. <laughs> um, but that is an aspect. Yes? You know, um, speaking of Agnes Martin, I heard me feel that I was told some years ago, uh, asked her why painting was called, maybe it was a cliff, maybe it was a tree, or whatever. And she said, her answer was, uh, because it is a tree. And uh, of course, obviously, didn't care that but I, I wish you would talk a little bit about your, your relationship to being a landscape painter. Yeah. The best way I could really answer that is, for me, a landscape isn't just looking at the horizon line or looking at trees or looking at water or whatever comprises the image of a landscape. But the experience of a landscape, you, you might be sitting on a rock looking at the trees or looking at the water and you can feel the sun on your back, you can feel a bit of a breeze uh, you can hear the birds, or you can hear a truck go by, but it's an experience. It's a full experience, and sometimes that experience holds you for a long time. Uh, for instance, watching a, a sunset. You, know, you, you might just kind of stare for a half hour without really moving. But there's so many things affecting that experience. Again, it's the temperature, it's the sounds. And I like to think of my paintings as possessing some of that experience, something that's beyond just the depiction of, of a landscape. Does that answer it a little bit? Trying to, I'm trying to simplify this answer. <laughs> um, it was very difficult. Uh, I, I, I used to be a really controlled person, and everything in the work was, was quite controlled. And where I went to undergraduate school was taught by Bauhaus instructors. And they went to Black Mountain from Germany. They ended up at Washington U, several of them. And several of my instructors were also uh, abstract expressionists. So I was being taught the exact contrast that I'm using right now in the work. And the drip is something that was always used by abstract expressionists because it, it's an entryway into the work. Uh, the drip is something you respond to because it's not controlled in the same way of those horizontal lines. A drip goes down, it makes a little kink. Uh, if you look at it, the drips in these paintings close, usually it doesn't have a center. The pigment migrates to the very edge and changes color. And I respond to that in the same way an abstract expressionistic uh, painter would respond. And the contrast to the horizontal sets up that precise thing I was looking for. So once I discovered the drip and let it alone so I could literally use it as a visual 
component. Uh, I mean, literally my life changed. It, it's, it was, um, I didn't have to pay a lot of money for a psychologist. <laughs> but that, that was basically, that was basically what happened. Um, and I was using Sumi brushes and um, another person I left out that was very important was Bryce Morgan. And he went through exactly the same thing. He, the back series, Helen, was the last of the planar paintings. He went to linear paintings after the back series. And I was watching him, and I was feeling I was going through exactly the same process without realizing I was going through it. It was only in hindsight I could see how important he was. Any other questions? Hey, David. I think that's our time, but thank you guys. And Johnny will be here signing copies of books if anybody wants one. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to hear you talk about it. Johnny Winona Ross lives and works in Taos, New Mexico. He received a BFA from Washington University in 1971 and an MFA from the University of Illinois in 1973. He's won numerous awards, including the International Support Grant from the Gottlieb Foundation, a Fulbright Artist in Residence Award, and Artist Residence Cité Internationale des Arts, Paris, France. His work has been exhibited throughout the U.S. and is in the collections of the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Portland Museum of Art in Portland, Maine, and the Harwood Museum of Art. Ross's work is well sought after, with collectors often waiting several months to purchase a painting. David Chickey is the publisher and creative director of Radius Books, a nonprofit art book publishing company. He's the former board chair of the Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill and Sussex University. David Chickey and Radius Books published the book, Johnny Winona Ross.